operators and a couple of uh, solution providers. Um, panel's gonna look at data analytics and machine learning. Um, the password for this panel is spreadsheet, one word spreadsheet. So for those of you playing along at home, you can, uh, you can enter that word. Uh, so Felicia Felici is, is, is back by popular demand. Uh, he moderated this session this morning and uh, he, he's back to moderate this session. So Felicia, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and then uh, allow each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, we've got a lot to cover, so we'll get stuck straight into it. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. I'm very happy to uh, moderate this session. Um, so uh, I'm a digital transformation uh, advisor. I've been working for Stormerger, Weatherford, and uh, Baker Hughes in different uh, roles in data transformation. And uh, recently I've been I'm helping uh, Keros to uh, uh, try to get to you guys. Uh, uh, Keros is a platform, uh, orchestration platform to connect different uh, system together uh, intelligibly and there's uh, 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 you can find them in the sponsors so uh, I'll uh, stop my shameless uh, uh, plug right here and uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, Jeremy to introduce himself. Yeah thanks uh, Philippe. Well good afternoon everyone thanks for joining the panel. Um, my name is Jeremy Eid. I've been in the industry around uh, over 20 years. Um, started out in software development and technology and uh, implementation, joined BP about nine years ago in a data management role, and about three, four years ago, I decided to pivot into data analytics, and I graduated with my master's in analytics last year. I uh, was a practicing data scientist in the uh, onshore BPX um, business, and then this year I joined the Gulf of Mexico team. Uh, I'm with a team who do data management, data engineering, and data analytics. So um, we do whatever we can to support the business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sastri, would you mind? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the session. I'm uh, Sastri Malade. Um, I be co-founded um, a company called Foghorn about five years ago, along with our CEO, David King, which provides edge computing, machine learning AI solutions for industrial environment, specifically oil and gas and manufacturing. Saudi Aramco, which is one of the largest oil and gas companies is an investor in us. We closely work with Schlumberger and a number of others too. I personally, myself, I've been in the technology industry for 30 plus years, all the big companies, IBM, Oracle, uh, eBay, and so on, as well as several of startups that uh, some I co-founded, some others that I joined, but um, we're actually seeing significant traction in the last few years, especially for oil and gas with several use cases for machine learning, which is the topic of this session. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Hafshin, would you mind uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Afshin Telesonos. I'm currently serving a role as Director of Corporate Planning and Performance at Laredo Petroleum. And prior to coming to Laredo as a Chesapeake, where I served in a variety of leadership roles in finance and strategic, but my last few years there, I was actually a senior data scientist where I was heavily involved in deploying machine learning um, solutions across the operations um, departments uh, at Chesapeake, as well as being uh, heavily involved in uh, machine learning strategy and deployment there at the company. Thank you very much. And uh, last but not least, Manoj. Hello everyone, this is Manoj Ergorpu. I'm the managing director on Vsoft Labs. Uh, uh, we handle a lot of automation, both AI, edge, um, IoT driven, and we also work closely with uh, uh, AI Innovation Consortium, which is also had which also had a uh, earlier session. Uh, I come from a technological background, about 16 years of experience into web, mobile, uh, and uh, data analytics side. Thank you very much, Manoj. With that, let's start. Sir. Uh, with our questions. So the first one that uh, comes is uh, uh, when it comes to address uh, uh, machine learning and IoT data deluge, uh, how can machine learning models help operators gain uh, return on investment from their data? Uh, any oil and gas use case you could point at? Uh, who wants to start with that? I can start if you like me to, Philip. So, um, 
Yeah, so th there are a number of use cases in oil and gas, if, as, uh, as, you know, as the audience is familiar with midstream, upstream, downstream use cases out there. Let's pick one, any use case, for example, let's say emissions flare monitoring, right? Uh, a lot of the times when you're processing the gas in a, in a, in a gas plant, sometimes potentially due to either, you know, what are called foaming issues that um, while converting the sour gas into sweet gas or sometimes the compressor problems, whatever the reasons are, sometimes you just have to let the, uh, uh, you know, the gas release to what is called an oil stack. And of course, that has business problems. One is you're actually releasing, you know, gas into atmosphere, you're losing the gas. The second is the potential, uh, you know, issues with respect to pollution environment, right? World Bank is closely monitoring the EPA regulations and all of that. Now, obviously, once it is already there, you see it, you know, go back and stop there. But where machine learning comes in a picture, how do you predict proactively based on, based on either the factors that are like the sensors, the flow rate, the gas flow, the compressor sensors, and then, uh, you know, the foaming trains and all of that, use machine learning to predict to say potentially, when is this condition going to occur? So I can go and proactively prevent that. This is a significant ROI, both tangible and intangible. Tangible in the sense that you are actually controlling the volume of the gas that's being wasted. Intangible in the sense that you are also being not penalized um, either directly or indirectly for releasing these toxic uh, gases into the atmosphere. So it's just one such use case, we actually closely work with Ram Ghosh, Lamarji, and a number of others, as I had mentioned, many, many use cases where machine learning comes into play in these, uh, in, in these, for these use cases. So how, how do we uh, address the, uh, the machine learning and IoT uh, data deluge? Anyone uh, wants to take a little bit on that one? Touch a little bit on that? Sure, yeah. Uh, I, I, okay. Go ahead, Jeremy. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was gonna say, don't use spreadsheets. Um, so what, what quantitative data are we talking about? I mean, 500 to one over a thousand variables as columns, if number of rows could be, I don't know, 3 billion. Um, so you're, you're most likely going to be looking at some sort of cloud technology. Um, lots of vendors out there, lots of technologies out there that this issue is just trying to, you know, pick and choose the right one. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so you, you're leveraging the cloud for this um, and you've got basically your machine learning is what's going to help is with trying to get correlations from that. Um, it's good at getting correlations and it's up to the subject matter experts to figure out the causation and are the correlations, are you learning anything that you can do differently? Um, but yeah, don't use spreadsheets, use some sort of cloud database. Uh, yeah, so to just add to what Jeremy was saying, completely agree with moving to the cloud. Um, you, you need the processing, you, you need all the benefits that the cloud providers, provides. You know, a couple of ways that we look at, at machine learning and, and sort of the digital transformation is, is we like to look at it as a sort of building blocks, right? Where you get the real value um, from all of your data and from all of the new tools like machine learning and, and cloud compute, et cetera, is, is really by building a strategy that builds off of each other. And that's when you start getting real results from, you know, the aggregative or the additive approaches of of what you're trying to do in your digital transformation. So as an example of that is, is really starting with your data, right? Sometimes you have so much data, both from legacy IoT or modern IoT um, devices, that it's difficult to know what's important to you, right? What should you be using? How, how do you take that data into account to be able to, to make better dec decisions in your field operations? And so one of the first things that machine learning can help is just understanding what's signal and what's noise in your data what matters and what doesn't. Um, the second piece and what that begins to start unlocking is that now you can actually start thinking about solutions, whether that's through your data discovery, um, that's starting to partner with your operators who are very close to the problems and the opportunities that you're trying to realize and start brainstorming and showing data that can show different perspectives. And what we have found is that can have a real material impact, not only just on the idea generation, but the actual implementation of machine learning out into the field where you're starting to really realize that value. And then once you know what's important and how to deploy it out into the field and you start getting those ideas, that actually starts opening up the door for automation. And so um, automation can be just a huge ROI generator um, in two ways. One, to help unlock the, the technical professionals you already have that might be spending way too much time in spreadsheets, but also it can start automating processes that maybe you've not had the opportunity to get to yet that are value accretive. 
And so, so machine learning can really, in a building block approach, one, help you with your data, help you start integrating with your field operators and delivering solutions um, for, for value added items, but then also then start unlocking potential automation opportunities, um, both in the field and in the office that may not have been available to you prior to, to really knowing what was the signal in the noise. Just to add to that, sorry, go ahead, Philip, you're saying something. Go, go oh, ahead, go ahead. Ah, okay. No, just to, just to add to what Ashin said that, the amount of data for multiple reasons where uh, uh, the edge computing adds a significant value here is not only separating the noise from what, what is relevant and what, what is important, but doing it at, at the location where you don't have to transmit that much data. And, and some of these things, it's not, it's not a small amount of data, two terabytes uh, just from one location per day is a huge amount, not to mention how remote they can be if you have to use a satellite link. Um, and even if you do it, uh, the latency and the need for real-time action, they all matter. So that's where I think uh, cloud computing comes in very handy here, where you don't have to probably share all the information or, or send all the information, but you can process whatever business rules you need to, or, or what are orchestrations you need to trigger, or what are business logic you need to run. So you're actually sending relevant information or, or relevant inputs once the data is analyzed uh, and unprocessed, right? So that, that combination of how can we reduce the data deluge? One thing is for sure, what, what, what we think today is irrelevant could be extremely relevant today. So what they say is a second of data lost is, is, is a second of ROI you're losing. Maybe not now, maybe five years from now, 10 years from now. But at the same time, you can't just transmit all this data, store all this data and, and try to weed through this, uh, this data to figure out what is important, right? So decentralizing that analysis at the, at the edge level and trying to figure out what are those things that I need to trigger? What are those things that I need to transmit for now uh, while the data still is stored and probably archived later, uh, kind of that uh, uh, not exactly hybrid cloud, it's a, it's a too often used word, uh, but I think something similar to that, uh, where you're processing at the edge, but again, not losing the data and still storing the data. Very good, actually, that's, we were really into the second question, which is perfect. Thank you so much, Manoj. Um, Anyone else has to uh, uh, IDs? So basically the ID, uh, as Manoj just mentioned, is uh, quality versus quantity. And what do we process at the edge and what do we move uh, to the cloud? And, and, and eventually well, I, back from the cloud to the edge. Right, so if I can uh, speak on that, because that's our primary you know, technology focus area that we've been working on. Many of these scenarios, if we look at a remote gas plant or remote uh, oil rig or any of these places out there, you simply may not have, do not have a connectivity you know, to a cloud or a central environment to be able to send terabytes and petabytes of data, especially if you're talking about video and audio, which is where the deep learning and machine learning comes into picture. You simply don't have that kind of a pipe, right? You, and you want to process it, just like Manoj said, you want to process it where the data is being produced in real time in order to derive insights um, so you can move on and then send those results into a central uh, location, whether it's cloud, on-prem data center, wherever you're sending it to. But the key here is that sometimes you do need to mix um, the real-time live data with some existing you know, um, spec data, for example, that might be sitting in like an MES system or a central database or some other location out there. This is typically what we call sensor fusion. How do you fuse these things together so that you can apply both the live real-time data plus the, you know, the standard specifications and spec data for the machine, process it, derive the insights, take care of that, uh, alert the operator, notify the operator, do whatever else if you need to automate it using actuation to do that, but only send the results. But why do you need to send the results? Typically for two reasons. One is of course, you may have multiple set sites. So you want you know, somebody looking at a central you know, site to say, look, what's happening across all these different sites, they want to know that. But second, more importantly, in machine learning, one aspect of machine learning is that even though you create a model, you train it, you perfectly you know, 
you know, accurate model, you deploy it. What happens over time is that because of the changes in the data drifts or you know, some other machine behavior changes, that exact same machine learning model that once used to accurately predict the results may no longer do that, may begin to drift. The precision might you know, come down. This is where you would actually use some of the data, the resample, downsample data at that time to actually incrementally retrain the model so that the accuracy continues to be what it is. So in other words, cloud has the place for what it is to play, but edge is where you directly process the live data combining it with any combining with any spec data, and then incrementally retrain based on the information you send to a central location. That's kind of, it's a perfect scenario where you're optimizing for your connectivity, latency, and real-time actions with the accuracy results that are needed to use cloud for retraining purposes. Thank you very much, Astri. So let's uh, jump to the, a, a, a little bit of another subject now. What is the, so, we know, especially in our oil and gas industry, we tend to be pretty siloed. So what is the importance of a cross-silo enterprise-wide data strategies for machine learning programs and data analytics? Uh, uh, Jeremy or Afshin, do you have? Yeah, um, for us, we've kind of spent a bunch of time this year on just the basics, which is, which is well header. So that's all the information hanging off a well. Um, if you have your silos, organizational silos with data silos, um, often things basics like, you know, what is a well? Um, you, you've got to get that right and you've got to try and figure that out so you can join the data together. So when you feed it into a data, you know, machine learning, it has not only your financial data, but it also has subsurface and drilling operations and, and production. So. Absolutely. Uh, yes, it is important, um, you know, break down the silos and kind of you need to uh, look across the whole enterprise and um, not only within internally, but externally with partners, JVs, um, regulators, um, data vendors, but figure out how you're going to join the data together so that you can, when you get to the machine learning model building stage, you can actually have, you know, a good data set. So, so yes, it's important, at least a VP. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would agree with everything Jeremy said. You know, I, I think one thing that's important is that if you think about just a well, right, how you drill it affects how you complete it, how you complete it affects how you put the equipment, and then how you put the equipment affects your production, and your production ultimately impacts your ability to generate margin. All of those things aren't separate items. And so without reduced silos or, or removing your silos, you can build machine learning solutions for production. You can build machine learning solutions for your, your artificial lift. You can build machine learning solutions maybe for completions and for drilling. But really it's the combination of all of those things. All of those things make a well. Whenever you have attributes from one of those areas that impact another part of your downstream activities to make a well, but you have no way to influence your downstream activities to result in the best outcome possible from the investment in a well, then you're not maximizing your ROI. So, uh, you know, in many ways, the importance is directly related on how important is it to the organization to maximize ROI. Um, and, you know, so for us, it's, it's, it's extremely important. And we, we very much take a multi, multidisciplinary approach um, to how we um, deploy machine learning or any really analytic solution um, in our business. And we, we have, we create cross-functional groups, even getting people involved early and aware, even if the solution may not be directly related to their particular department, because inevitably we always see ideas and opportunities come from people who are part of um, all of the different process and tasks that ultimately end up you know, realizing the investments we make into the ground. Very good. Uh, let's uh, move on to our next question. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, predictive analytics, uh, how can machine learning based data analytics be used with the legacy data lakes to help improve future operations and prevent repeat failures? Uh, anyone wants to start tacking on this one? Yeah, I, I can chime in a couple of, you know, this happens all the time, uh, Philip, in the sense that Historically, all companies, all organizations um, were typically capturing 
some historical failure information or other information in their existing MEA system, some databases, um, whether time series databases, newer NoSQL databases, or it doesn't matter what kind of system that they have, legacy data lakes, as you're calling them. Now, that information is actually important to combine to the real-time live data that's coming in, not only for inference, but more important for training. Because in order for you to predict, for example, a compressor is going to fail, you know, yes, you're seeing the live data right now, the vibration data, whatever else you're getting in. But how do you know what sort of conditions were actually leading up to the failure? You do need that historical data. That historical data is typically sitting in a legacy data lake system. So it's really important to access that. And um, but for uh, not only for training, but also for even for inferencing, you don't necessarily need historical data for inferencing, but you do need, like I said, spec limits and things like that. So the biggest thing really here, one thing I wanted to just clarify the, the distinction here, right? So we even, you know, early on five years ago, when we walked into a lot, a lot of these sites, we said, you can do analytics. You bring in all this flow rates, temperature, pressure, vibration, you name it, get all of that information and try to do some analytics on that. But guess what? Many a times, these customers are not in a position to sell exactly what condition, what particular sensor set of values are leading up to a failure condition, right? This is where you got to apply either typical machine learning, whether you're doing anomaly detections, regressions, and things like that, or if you're including video, audio, acoustic vibration, which is a much more modern way of doing this, you need some sort of a deep learning as well. So to, uh, to, to summarize, to answer your question, absolutely, we do need to combine uh, you know, the data that's previously stored in historical or legacy data lakes with the live data to be able to achieve what um, the ROIs that we're looking at, the customers are looking at. And uh, how, how difficult it is to do that, Manoj? Do you have anything to, to plug into that? Right. So I'll take one example that, uh, that Sastri mentioned earlier, um, um, uh, the flare stack detection, right? Uh, let's say you have this video data. People have been taking this video of using thermal cameras and whatnot. There are several companies that do that. And then along with that, you have these sensors that can bring in uh, bring in uh, pressure of the pumps and, and uh, different gauges. What are the information that might lead up to that kind of a flare, right? Historically, what's happening is you're taking this data and, and uh, it's no shame that many companies still store it in Excel and you put it in, in, in a point somewhere. And at that point, when you did it, probably you have a reference to uh, uh, the flare came up and I'm looking at it. Many of them don't even have the timestamps properly done. And even if let's say you have the timestamps, you have to use those, uh, those models historically to generate what led up to and, and define some predictive models. But your situational awareness is missing when it happens next time. So somehow if you can merge, especially Let's take the video of the flare itself. And then if, and, and with all these powerful systems now, uh, you can use OpenGL so on and so forth and on the GPU, you'll have an overlaps of all this business intelligence information, these analytics, right? You now have a single source that you can look at and see what happened exactly at that time. While you're using that for training, next time it happens, you can pull up, it, 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 it's more like you, you have your uh, uh, previous team played uh, and you're marking what is it the next team would be reaching, like the two graphs kind of a thing, right? Uh, it, it's a reference point where you can look at it and say that, okay, this is what can happen because historically this is what happened and, and this is how close we are. And, and probably the situation is different, probably the scenario is different, but someone looking at that data, an engineer on the ground, or someone who can take an action can easily disfer that information, tweak those parameters and understand what can happen next. And, and, and this also helps with decentralizing of, of the decision making. Right? Uh, the person who has to operate, change a switch or, or reduce the pressure or whatever they have to do, they don't need to be at a very high technical level where they have to understand all of this. If you can combine this data and present it and give them as this is what can happen, and this is what you should be doing. So it makes it very easy to take the quick decisions, real-time decisions, while using the old data on top of the new data or the current real-time scenario. You know, what one one area where we think um, combining, you know, 
machine learning based data analytics with our legacy data lakes is actually creating synthetic sensors. So a, a lot of these older wells, they're, they're really not, it's really not economic to go put new sensors on them. It just, it just isn't going to work, right? I mean, some of these wells might produce, especially onshore US, 5, 10, 15 barrels a day. Um, I don't think anyone's going to want to go put thousands and thousands of dollars of, of new IoT tech on these wells. But, but what you can do is you can actually use the relationships from newer wells that do have these sensors um, and then use your older data and your data lakes to actually create synthetic um, modern sensors for those old legacy wells. And what that ends up doing is it takes all of your learnings and all of your investment from your new development and allows you to apply those learnings and those sensors to your, to your um, existing base production where you can now actually start um, realizing value from that base production, whether it's better LOE, more efficient production, um, if you've got a lot of rod lifts, you know, maximizing and optimizing your rod lifts. And so there's a lot that can be done with combining those two data elements and then transferring the learning into synthetics onto the old data lakes. Absolutely. Um, so what are the barriers to widespread live data analytics using machine learning? Jeremy, do you, have, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I was thinking about that. Um, is it technology? I don't think it's technology. I think we have a lot of technology out there which we can use. Is it data? Maybe. I mean, I think I would still argue we, we have a lot of data, it just takes time to, to access and wrangle it. Skills, everyone's upskilling. There's lots of people, you know, um, doing from, from online courses to, to degrees. Um, you know, I think it's, to me, it's um, organizational change, perhaps, in that um, is the data analytics project a science project where it, it kind of gets presented and then gathers dust? Or is it transformational change? And to me, I think it's the is the organization ready to, to kind of fully embrace um, analytics and kind of make it part of the day-to-day -day business as opposed to some kind of exotic research project, which you look at once a month and get an update. So to me, I think, um, yeah, maybe it's organization. Yeah, I would uh, agree with Jeremy in the sense that um, it, these things cannot be science experiments, right? So if it is just a science experiment, this, this is not going to sustain. But but I think the biggest challenge we have seen typically is, um, of course, for any machine learning, it's all about data. You need to have access to data. If you can't have access to data, you can't really have, you know do any processing on that. Uh, and, and sometimes legacy systems, if you've got typically in this um, environment, you've got the SCADA systems behind and you have your IT systems. These IT systems and the networks typically don't have access to the actual machines and the sensors on the network. So you carefully navigate through all of that, but that's, that's a technical challenge that can be overcome. There's also an organizational challenge typically that uh, also happens in these environments. There is a divide, the bridge between this IT and OT, right? The IT people who have got access to these data lakes or systems and you know, all of these uh, uh, boxes and machines where you can install things, that's one thing. And you've got operational folks who are engineers who are on the ground. They're basically, they have a controls on this machine. Their neck is on the line if something goes wrong. So they have to be aligned with the IT folks. And you can't, the IT folks can't just walk in and say, well, look, let's install this solution. Let's put this machine learning and let's just run it, right? Now, what happens if, if something does bad, right? So the first thing we always tend to do, especially after talking with many, many folks out there, number one, look, do we, are there challenges to get access to data? If so, how do we get around it? Second, how do we bring the IT and the OT folks to the same table so we're aligned, everybody's aligned, everybody's clear of the ROI, so and it's not a science experiment that we can move forward. So those are really important things to, uh, to get it on first. Ashin. Just, just, to add, just to add to that, I, I think there are a couple of other things. I think one barrier that, that can be oftentimes overlooked is the idea that digital transformation and machine learning or IT projects, they're not, they're business projects. I think that's the, one of the first things. Secondly, um, you know, machine learning is, is always not well understood. And I think democratizing machine learning and its understanding across the organization and finding a way to um, get those tools into people's hands that are not necessarily data scientists or, or data analysts is key. 
And that's for two reasons. One, I think it increases awareness and it also create, creates a comfortability with that tool, right? And I, and I think Sastry said it really well. If you're an engineer and, and you're on the line for that result, your tendency is going to go as to what you know is reliable to deliver you that result. Even though there may be a better tool, if there's not familiarity and trust in that tool to actually deliver that outcome, there's going to be a tendency to not use it. And so I think trust is a really big thing as we talk about moving away, you know, moving into digital transformation and using um, machine learning. I think also too, there can be a little bit of um, sort of a little too much hype and overuse um, of, of machine learning and that it's, you know, it's, it's going to be the, the solver of all problems, which, which actually isn't true. Um, it's again, a, a very good toolbox in the tool, but always isn't the right tool to use for every solution. Um, and, and then, you know, lastly, I think how to interpret what machines are telling you is a really key element. It's not always clear um, what a machine is telling you is, is, is what you should or should not do. I mean, I think we would all agree that, you know, you just don't do what the model says, right? <laughs> Uh, I think we've all learned that probably the hard way in, in our careers. You just don't do what the model says. And so how do you take, like if, if you don't have good, strong familiarity with the machine learning model, for instance, right? And, and it's probabilistic based, right? What does it mean that when a machine tells you there's a 70% probability that this event is gonna happen on a well? What, what do you do with that, right? What does that mean to you as a person who's trying to make a decision to add value to the company? And so decision-making with machine learning, I think is a very critical skill that oftentimes gets overlooked when we think about deploying machine learning in our organizations and having a multi-year strategy on how you're gonna deploy machine learning, how you're gonna support machine learning, and then ultimately how you're going to train and support decision-makers to use machine learning in everyday decisions. And, and, and being committed to that in a multi-year process, I think is critical um, to really being able to reduce barriers, you know, to what we call live data analytics. I agree with you uh, for uh, any, you mentioned trust. I actually happen to have written a quite long article on the uh, uh, Cutter magazine. You can go on my blog and uh, and you can find it. But uh, to me, trust is the keystone of digital transformation. But let's, we have only a few minutes, so let's move to the last one, the question that is definitely not the least one, uh, data security concerns and considerations. I think we've all been uh, burning our fingers on this one. Who wants to uh, start uh, grabbing uh, a piece of the fire? <laughs> yeah, well, I could chime in a couple and I'll make sure I'll leave time for others to chime in as well. But data security is important, especially I'll tell you from our experience in the oil and gas industry, right? It's even more sensitive because you're talking about if something goes wrong and somebody were to connect all these highly expensive machinery into any kind of um, connectivity, you know, cybersecurity attacks and whatnot, right? So, and uh, we're talking about significant amount of um, damages here. So typically what we have seen is that this is where the disconnected nature of these edge processing machine learning connected to oil rigs you know, gas processes, refineries, compressors, ESPs, you name it, right? So typically what happens is these machines are not connected to internet. There is this notion of what is called edge to cloud uh, connectivity, meaning that somebody sitting in the cloud simply cannot punch a connection to these edge devices and have access to these machinery, right? Only the edge devices have to come and connect through the firewalls to the open port so they can identify themselves to multiple levels of securities that implemented to authenticate to anybody to send the information. That's one, meaning that nobody sitting in the cloud, nobody sitting in the internet, we have access to this machine. Second, even the machines that are there at the edge, in order for some typical things like authentication, authorization, all the typical things you would do, they're always there in place. But more importantly, sensitive data that actually is critical to the person is always encrypted. Whether the data is in motion, whether the data is at rest, it's always encrypted. But the most important thing is access to it. The access to it must be limited. People who are authorized to take actions on it based on what the data is telling you, what the model is telling you, to Afshin's comment earlier. So, you know, people are not gonna take by default whatever the model tells you that's the right thing. They have to validate it. 
but whoever is going to authorize that has to have the right access to. So authorization access, data encryption for data at rest and motion, more importantly, not being able to connect to these machines from a cloud environment are extremely critical for a successful uh, implementation um, avoiding these cybersecurity attacks. Any other thoughts? No, I agree with uh, with, with what Sastri mentioned, uh, especially this decentralized nature of having these different IoT devices and uh, edge-based solutions, right? And, and getting the information on need-to-know basis rather than centralizing everything for the sake of it uh, is not, it links back to one of the questions you asked earlier. What are some of the reasons where people are not even, uh, or adoption has not been that much is because the data collection and, and data collection is, is because of the trust of the people that are concerned about sending this sensitive data to a location where it's all centralized, easily accessible if someone were to hack into it, right? So this kind of need to know information where you can still store locally and send refined inputs to people that should access them for a particular reason uh, is very critical implementation. Knowing why we are doing what we are doing and need from a particular area instead of just dumping everything in one location, I think is very critical at this uh, at this age where uh, the risk of of having exposed is tremendous. Uh, one of the operators want to uh, pitch in and uh, yeah, um, I guess tell us about your scars. Well, I can say that you know. I guess two years ago, whatever, we you know talked a lot about DevOps and we're going to do DevOps squads. And then over the last 12 months, maybe, I've started to see you know DevSecOps appear as, as a kind of term and a, a team. And I think it's, it's great. I think it's um, previously, perhaps, there was the mindset that digital security is just another tick in the box, a hoop you have to jump through to get your project deployed. And it's a pain and whatever, but we just have to do it. But now, you know, with the, you know, vulnerabilities and the risks and um, it's got to be kind of baked in there from the start of the project. And it's not kind of an afterthought or sort of hoop. It's, it's actually an integral part. And that's possibly why I've started to see more DevSecOps um, type definitions within at least our company and, and what we're doing. So, um, yeah, absolutely. The more we do in the cloud, the more we do on the edge. Um, security needs, it's like the first thing you need to get right. So. Afshin, you have two minutes to uh, give us the word of the uh, the wise word. Well, I, I mean, I, I think everything Jeremy said is is absolutely correct. And, you know, one of the things that you always have to balance is, is your older SCADA and IoT um, devices are not as secure as the modern ones. Um, and that's that's always a, a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, Jeremy brings up an interesting point too, is, is um, you know, your security has always been looked at as a barrier to, to getting your project done, right? Like, what, you know, what, why can't I just get through this and, and get things deployed? But as we think about, you know, machine learning, um, imagine you're in an organization with hundreds of thousands of machine learning models being deployed to the edge and you don't have good security. And you, you may not have the monitoring tools or the people to know when machine learning uh, models have been compromised and what that could ultimately mean to your organization. And so, you know, these are really, really critical items when we think about security. And I think ultimately, and coming back to the trust thing is that you have to be able to trust your models are working. And to be able to do that, you first must know that they're secure. Well, I think we are just finishing uh, exactly on, on the dot. We are, you're a fantastic uh, uh, speaker. Thank you so much for uh, those very uh, wise uh, uh, point of views on all those different uh, channels. And uh, Simon, I think uh, the, I'm going to turn it back to you. Fantastic, Philippe. Thank you. And it's a credit to your chairperson skills that you finished exactly on time. So uh, well done, everyone. Uh, great presentation. Uh, please, if you can, make your way over to the to the event platform, to the, uh, to the speaker meet and greet area. Uh, we've got 20 minutes till the next presentation, which is the second last presentation of the day. We